Good evening, everyone. At the very outset, I would like to thank Dr. Balabaskar, sir, and Dr. Srinivasu, sir, for giving me this opportunity to be part of ISA Bellari academic activity. The topic that I'll be discussing today is dealing with the aftermath of a perioperative death. Now, death is something which we often don't discuss, either be it in the CMEs or even when we have family meetings, because so death is something that which we don't like. So we tend to avoid this topic. Perioperative deaths are very rare, but they can always be an inevitable part of our medical practice. Now, understanding our responses to these events is critically important because it allows us to prepare for that event. And by timely and proper intervention, it can limit its impact on the personals involved especially the anesthesiologist. Now, a clinical scenario I would like to describe. An otherwise healthy ASA1 patient who was scheduled for an outpatient operation under general anesthesia, the patient had no discernible underlying risk factors and recovery was expected to be routine. Early post-operative discharge was anticipated. The pre-operative interrogation, the physical examination, and the laboratory analysis were all unremarkable. Intraoperatively, however, something unexpectedly went dramatically and terribly wrong, and the patient died. Now, this is this scenario is what I would like to describe as every anesthesiologist nightmare. And when faced with such a nightmare, we will be having a lot of questions in our mind: what to do, what not to do. How to reveal this incident to the relatives? Where to go? Whom to talk to? Whom to ask for help? And what will be my future? Now, these are the questions to which we uh, find it very difficult to find answers. Now, if you look at history, it is believed that the first case of death related to anesthesia happened on 26th January, 1848. And the birth of anesthesia was in uh, uh, 16th October 1846. So almost one and a half years down the line, we had the first death, which was related to anesthesia. And it was as a consequence of unrecognized pulmonary aspiration caused by the administration of brandy, which was administered to counter the effects of inhaled chloroform. The patient was a 15-year-old Hannah Greener, who had come for removing her toenail to Dr. Thomas Megison, who was a surgeon who administered chloroform. In fact, from her past history, it revealed that the, her toenail of the other leg was removed three months before using thiethyl ether. As per the uh, uh, recollection of Dr. Uh, Thomas Megison, he said that after administering anesthesia, uh, anesthesia using chloroform, he found that the patient became unconscious and he noticed that her face had become blanched. It was become plain. So he decided he called for water and then dashed some of it on her face. It had no effect. And hence he gave her some brandy into her uh, uh, mouth, which he says that she swallowed with difficulty. And then he took her from the chair and put her on the floor and then uh, tried to resuscitate her. So this is his version of what happened on that day. And uh, there were uh, quite conflicting uh, views on this uh, event. And Dr. James Simpson, who was a proponent of chloroform, said that the death is because of aspiration and not because of the chloroform. While Dr. John Snow said that this was death was due to cardiac arrest because of the direct toxicity of chloroform on the heart. And the people of, uh, of that day uh, supported Dr. John Snow because of his standing mm -hmm. as the uh, uh, physician anesthesiologist to the Queen. Now, coming to the present scenario, from evidence, anesthesia has become much safer over the decades. Mm -hmm. And anesthetic and perioperative mortality have really reduced worldwide over the last few decades. However, as developments in the field of surgery takes place, we have now robotic surgery, minimally access surgery. It allows us to treat patients with multiple diseases at either extremes of age. 
So the surgical and the anesthetic risks definitely will increase. There have been significant efforts to analyze errors and to investigate critical incidents that take place. Now, the decreasing mortality rate is because of mainly two factors, because of the adopted safety measures that we have inculcated in the practice of anesthesia. For example, we have inculcated uh, or we have uh, used advanced monitoring for, of patients to enhance their safety, as well as a systematic use of uh, risk prevention guidelines, which are being issued by various uh, associations uh, for our anesthesia practice. However, preventable drug-related deaths, they remain. And the goal of zero anesthesia-related deaths is still far from being achieved. This study published in Lancet in the year 2012 was a meta-analysis of around 10,000 patients, both in the developing and the developed countries. And they found that the mortality rate has decreased from the 1970s, where it was around 1.06%. This was a 48-hour mortality, uh, post-operative mortality, and it has reduced to 0.12% by the year 2010. However, they found that the mortality in the developing countries was much more than that in the developed countries. Another study published in the same year in the JAMA, uh, which was 30-day mortality, which they studied, they found that the 30-day mortality, post-operative mortality was around uh, one between 1 and 2%. And another uh, trial almost uh, done, uh, which studied the intermediate term mort mortality after non-cardiac surgery, this was the B unaware trial. It was alarmingly high. They studied the one-year mortality, and this one-year mortality, post-operative mortality, was found to be between 5 and 10%. And the, in 2016, uh, in the Lancet, the Lancet, uh, publication said that the Global Health Research Unit on Global Surgery, they found deaths within 30 days uh, was around, uh, each year they said that around 4.2 million people died. And it was, uh, if you look at the top 10 global causes of death in 2016, almost 7.7% .7 was because of post-operative deaths and it was a third in number. However, anesthesia, uh, the, the specialty of anesthesia has paid a lot of importance to patient safety. And way back in 1985, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation was uh, introduced uh, and they have their own newsletters and very recently, and they have their own annual conferences. And the recent conference was completed in May 2023. They have their vision statement that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care. In 2007, you had the WHO bringing out the a safe surgery, save lives campaign. And this was followed by the introduction of the surgical safety checklist in 2007. And uh, sorry, 2009. And uh, uh, the study, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, a multi center trial, an international tri trial that was published in 2010, uh, uh, following the introduction of surgical safety list and from India. The All India Institute of Medical Sciences daily took part in this uh, in this trial, and they found that after the before the introduction of the checklist, the death rate, which was one point five percent, it declined to 0.8 percent after the introduction of the safety surgical the surgical safety checklist, and the inpatient complications declined from eleven percent to. 7%. So this was uh, statistically very much significant and a very important step in providing patient safety. And in 2010, during the Euro Anesthesia uh, Conference uh, by the European Society of Anesthesiology, Tendency Care and the European Board of Anesthesiology, the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology was uh, accepted and was proposed and passed and accepted. And this was even accepted by the World Federation Society of Anesthesiology. And a very recent publication uh, in 2022 published at, in the Anesthesia and Analgesia where uh, world leaders in the field of anesthesia came together and they proposed steps to improve a worldwide perioperative safety by 2030 by implementing certain uh, practices. And we had from India, we had our ISA, 
past national president, Dr. Murlidhar Joshi, as a part of the team. And the top 10 uh, issues that they highlighted were, was implementation of uh, national or international standards of interoperative care in each country, sustained efforts to support, uh, to support appropriate numbers and distribution of physician anesthesia providers, support at national levels to provide access to appropriate anesthesia related drugs and equipment, development and implementation of databases to track patient safety and outcomes, extension of the patient safety initiatives, not only in the interoperative way, but to perioperative care, improvement and use of the uh, safety checklists, initiatives to detect and prevent death from perioperative deterioration, establishment of cultures of safety and teamwork, elimination of punitive outcomes and criminalization of medical errors, allocation of safety research and resources to non-operating room anesthesia practices too. So these are the 10 guidelines that they have given for improving the patient safety over by 2030. Now, anesthesia as a speciality is a six, six, six sigma defect free, defect process. So what it means is that uh, uh, a Six Sigma uh, defect free process means almost 99.99966% of the time it is defect free. That means defects are only 3.4 defects per a million process. And this is the aim of every manufacturing industry. And this is what every uh, uh, healthcare team should aim for. And Presently in medicine, anesthesia is probably the only speciality which is called as sigma six, six sigma defect free process. Now coming to the uh, aspect of intraoperative death, death to most people is a major life event and nothing in this world prepares us to face and manage perioperative death. Although if you look at it, majority of anesthesia, almost 30% of the anesthesiologists will be involved in an intraoperative death during the course of their careers. Now, whether death on table was expected or occurred but least expected, or maybe even later in the ICU, the anesthesiologist is the one who is most likely to be affected emotionally, physically in his personal life, as well as it can have an influence on his professional career. Now there are, based on the classification of perioperative deaths, there are basically two types of deaths which are anesthesia related. One is anesthesia contributory death, where the mortality could be due to the disease or injury during anesthesia and surgical activities. That is, for example, the patient had certain pre-existing uh, cardiovascular, respiratory or nervous complications and the administration of anesthesia led to worsening of that and led to collapse and death of the patient. The second group is anesthesia associated deaths or AAD. That is mortality which is directly caused by anesthetic activities. For example, you administer a drug, the patient develops hypersensitivity, anaphylaxis and expires. Or patient has an adverse drug reaction. Or the patient died because of overdosing of the drug. Or it could be because the patient died because of a equipment or a system failure, which is an anesthesia machine which uh, had a problem. So these are all called anesthesia associated deaths because anesthesia per se is responsible for a death. So there are anesthesia contributory deaths as well as anesthesia associated deaths. Now, although anesthetic deaths are uncommon, but death is a part of everyday medical care. The situation becomes even more critical where there is an unexpected death on table. Now, anesthetic death is defined as death occurring within 24 hours of administration of anesthesia due to causes related to anesthesia. Now, anesthesia as a speciality is a high risk speciality because there is a very thin margin of safety. And presently because of the advent of uh, improved monitoring and the use of uh, uh, certain guidelines, the mortality definitely has come down and the margin of safety has increased. The main issue here is anesthesiologists have very little interaction with patients and the patient's relatives. We tend to see patients only on the day before surgery or even in case of an emergency, we just see them during on the table. So we don't have time to interact with the patient, have a physician-patient bonding between the patient and the relatives. 
So the main issue here is the public is not at all aware about the role of an anesthesiologist, the type of anesthesia and the risks involved. So invariably in case of perioperative deaths, the anesthesiologist will have to bear the brunt of such a mishap. So the patient relatives could react in a very hostile manner toward the anesthesiologist and seek redressal in police station or courts of law. I mean, perioperative deaths, whether the death may be due to surgical causes, even due to surgical causes, there is a tendency of the surgical team to put the blame on the anesthesiologist. And certain specialties in the field of, in the surgical field are known to do so. Well, I wouldn't like to name them. So during the, uh, when things are going all right, the perioperative team, everything is, everyone is happy. They act as a team. But when things go wrong, if there is a death, there is total chaos. The blame game is initiated on who is responsible. That is not the way things have to take place. Human error is a factor in anesthetic practice and its consequences more so than in other specialties. Because in our specialty, the consequences tend to be immediate, adverse, and conspicuous. A study of the anesthesia-related mortality in Australia and New Zealand, as well as uh, the confidential inquiry into period of deaths in the NHS in UK, it showed that the anesthetic mortality has tremendously come down because of uh, proper pre-anesthetic checkup and evaluation, extensive pre-operative, perioperative monitoring. So we have brought down the anesthesia mortality to an estimated prevalence of 0.5 to 0.8 in 100,000 anesthetics delivered. Now, suppose a perioperative death occurs. We have certain concerns. There are certain immediate concerns as well as delayed concerns. Now, compared to the immediate concerns, we have a dilemma where we will declare the death. How to deliver this bad news? How to manage the documentation? How to manage your OT staff? How to offer post-mortem examination to the, for the, of the deceased? Fear of assault and mob violence handling the police, media, and the threat of FIR and arrest. These are our immediate concerns. Now coming to our late concerns, we have a specter of litigation over our head. It could be a complaint to a professional body, like the Medical Council for Punitive Action. It could be a civil liability for damages and criminal prosecution in case of loss of life. There is loss of reputation and the phenomenon of second and third victim also is a late concern for the uh, medical personnel involved. We'll come to them one by one. Handling the patient. Now, the patient has expired on table, so the procedure has to be abandoned. The dilemma of place of declaration, where will you declare? If you have an ICU or a PACU, better to shift the patient to the uh, PACU, and this will give time for the relatives to accept that the patient has died and to come to terms with uh, the death of the patient. Whereas, uh, if you have a play, if you don't have an ICU or a PACO, you will have to declare it in the OR. You should facilitate the transfer of the body to the mortuary. As a mark of respect, it is appropriate for the anesthesiologist to escort the deceased to the theater suit exit. The relatives may demand that they would like to be with the deceased. So the relative should be given the opportunity to pay their last respects. And probably uh, there are some rituals they would like to do, which we should arrange a quiet area so that the uh, relatives can be, uh, can stay with the deceased for some time and even perform those rituals. We should arrange for an ambulance to shift for funeral. Handling the relatives, the team approach is vital. No passing of the buck or blame game has to be initiated with the surgical and the anesthesia team. We should try to update the relatives intermittently about the patient's critical status and declare the death slowly so that they get time to absorb the bad news and never speculate on the cause of death. Seek help from a senior anesthesiologist, preferably one who is working in the ICU. 
And that is another reason why it would be better to declare the death in the ICU because uh, the doctor working in the ICU is more familiar with breaking bad news. Now coming to the topic of breaking bad news, relative transparency is important, but good communication doesn't mean that we tell them, tell everything. You can show genuine concern about the unfortunate incident, answer all the queries of the relatives, and it should be delivered in a straightforward and honest way, avoid medical jargon. Before declaring the bad news, the surgeon and the anesthesiologist should meet together and reach a consensus on what to tell the patient and answer all the questions firmly. Time should be allowed for the information to be absorbed. The common reactions, the grief reactions that the patient's relatives may exhibit are shock, denial, and anger. And the team who declares this bad news should be prepared to deal with them. The relatives may want to see the body and provision for this in a quiet area should be made. Now, how do you break bad news? You have different uh, uh, protocols, the six-step protocol, the spikes protocol, the breaks protocol, and the ABCDE protocol. Now, the spikes protocol is the one that we commonly use where you get a proper setting for the patient and prepare the environment. You can use a social worker and be ready to listen to the grievances of the relatives, perception, uh, invitation and giving information, knowledge, uh, explaining what has happened and empathize with the patient's uh, relatives' emotions and uh, uh, the final S, S is for spike uh, of spikes is strategy and summaries to determine and summarize what has happened uh, in the uh, OR. So spikes is one way of delivering bad news. And uh, this part of bringing bad news is not a part of our anesthesia curriculum. So a study was published in 2017 in BMC Anesthesiology, where they had a simulation-based workshop on breaking bad news for anesthesiology residents, where a patient who underwent a, a, a small procedure uh, developed anaphylaxis to one of the drugs administered and patient expired, and uh, the scenario was created, and the relatives uh, and the uh, residents had to meet the relatives and uh, declare uh, the death. And so findings from the study uh, indicate that breaking bad news is a teachable skill. And they said that this has to be integrated into the curriculum of anesthesiology residents. Now dealing with operation theater and the operation theater personnel, now you have to leave things undisturbed in the theater. In case there is a suspicion of equipment failure or malfunctioning, then that piece of uh, equipment should be isolated for further investigations, preserve all broken ampules. It should be kept in a secured box for investigation. No loose stock should be allowed, especially in the lifts and canteens because, and the canteen, because these areas, the relatives of this patient could be there. So this should be a protocol that should be uh, implemented in all uh, theaters, especially the medical students, the nursing students, and your OD staff should not discuss anything related to this in the lifts and the canteen, and no information should be unnecessarily leaked out, especially to the media. Now, documentation, an accurate record of the sequence of events should be uh, written down, handwritten, and countersigned by the anesthesiologist. And this should include every detail of the routine that has been followed for that particular patient, including the perioperative checkup, the, uh, the investigations done, the drugs prescribed, the type of anesthesia planned, the surgical procedure done, and the interventions performed, and everything should be made into a record and a copy should be kept with you. Uh, <clears throat> all notes should be made contemporaneously, but during a critical care incident, it will be very difficult to track, keep track of time and to keep the, and to note them uh, simultaneously. So whenever such a thing happens, we should we would recommend you should delegate a member of the theater team to keep record of the events as they unfold. Documentation of the events and its appropriate management should be documented. And there should be no discrepancy in the notes of the surgical, nursing, and the anesthetic team. It's very important that the uh, the codes pay uh, more important to the nursing notes because they know that the surgeon and the anesthesiologist are quite clever people and they might. Uh, try to manipulate the notes, whereas the nursing uh, people are quite honest and they would be giving you uh, the correct picture. 
So we should make sure that there is no discrepancy in the notes of the three uh, people involved. And there should be no tampering with notes. Very, very important. Never, never, never tamper with the notes. And if you're making corrections, make sure that you countersign wherever corrections have been made. And in case the police snatches away the record and you have not completed, you still have the uh, option of uh, sending an email to the superintendent of police saying that the uh, investigating officer has snatched away the records and the records are not complete. And the court will uh, definitely uh, look into this matter of uh, uh, that you have already informed the police that it is not complete. Now, handling the media. Following such an event, there may be scenarios where the media might get involved and they will approach each and every hospital staff for statements because they want to sensationalize any deaths that happen. The nominated hospital representative should be the only person handling the media and all inquiries should be directed to him. And he or she should be well aware of all the facts that have happened and should give only the right information. Another thing that we are worried about is the mob frenzy. You know? More than the relatives, it are, there are certain social miscreants who create nuisance to the hospital and the employees. The property might be damaged. So we should keep an account of what has been damaged. Injured employees have to be taken care of. CCTV footage has to be provided as evidence to the, uh, the police. And another group of people who jump into the such situation are the local politicians. Now, they don't come to settle the issue. And they always would like to keep the issue burning so that they can divert attention from uh, the real issues. In Kerala, we have the Hospital Protection Act, which was a spineless act, where it was introduced in 2012. And almost 200 cases of violence against healthcare workers in Kerala since 2020 was uh, has been reported and not a single FIR or not a single, uh, FIR has been filed, but not a single culprit has been booked under this act. And it took, it led, uh, and it took the government, it took uh, a death of a doctor from one of these incidents for, for the government to wake up. And they amended this act in uh, uh, May 2020, 2023, very recently. And they have put stringent punishment for offenders, where if you commit serious physical violence, you have a term of almost seven years and a minimum fine of around uh, one to five lakhs. And the most important thing is the investigation should be completed within 60 days of registering the FIR. And special courts have been designated. How do you handle the police? It is better that you call the police rather than the relative calling the police once a perioperative death has happened. And as doctors, we should request for postmortem if the cause of death is not known. And if the relatives decline postmortem, that should be recorded uh, uh, that postmortem has been declined and the police uh, should issue a letter to the hospital stating that postmortem is not required. In case of mob violence, we uh, have to mention the names of miscreants if we know them and uh, hand them over to the police. And we should hand over always a copy of the CCTV footage. And suppose there is violence and injury to the employees of the hospital, nurses and the doctors, they should be preferably taken to a government or nearby government hospital and MLC should be, um, should be done. And we should always involve, involve the senior administrator or the legal advisor of the hospital. And records can be handed over to the investigating team, but a written acknowledgement of the same should be obtained. You should provide all available information and do not resist as it might be interpreted as non-cooperation. Very important is to debrief the theater team because this is a very stressful situation and this should be done as early as possible. We scrutinize the care that is provided perioperatively we articulate the circumstances of death. We reassure and console the team members. And the most important is to ensure self-care. The core elements of debriefing are description, analysis, and application. Now, how to incorporate the learning points from the incident into practice is application. Now, this has been shown to aid closing the performance gap in an individual's expertise. The most important thing before debriefing is you should tell all the 
members of the team that there is a bubble of safety and each member can speak up and voice their opinion during the debriefing and make it explicitly clear that blame is not being solved. So this will increase the freedom within the group of individuals to voice their opinions and even to admit to errors. The next step would be critical incident stress management, especially to uh, avoid the development of an abnormal stress response and to identify those who may need further counseling. Everybody don't react to stress in a similar way. People, uh, Some people might not take to stress uh, in a right way. They might uh, go in for a burnout. So the critical incident stress management is a very important part. Of the, it is based on two parts. One is diffusing, and the other one is a critical incident stress debriefing. Now, diffusing is just like debriefing. It's an informal group debriefing session, which occurs immediately after the incident. And the spear led, the HOD can lead it. And it will often take the form of an open discussion about the event. And it will also highlight key points for further critical incident stress debriefing. Now, this is a group session, which is done probably two to three days after the event, where specially trained individuals, especially the psychologists, uh, take part in it. They facilitate early help seeking. They can identify those in, uh, of the team who have an acute stress reaction and using certain techniques they can enable early recovery. There are different varieties of this. One of them is one way to do it is, uh, is you, the acronym BICEPS. Uh, we're not going into that. Now we move on to the person who will be most affected by such a perioperative death, that is the anesthesiologist. Now, basically anesthesiologists are all good people and uh, they tend to get uh, emotionally uh, upset, especially when a perioperative death has happened. There is the anesthesiologist displays signs of personal and professional anxiety. There is extreme fatigue, sleep disturbances, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypertension. He also demonstrates psychosocial symptoms like loss of confidence, flashbacks, grief, remorse, depression. There is a fear of damage to reputation, a fear of damage to self-esteem. There is a spectrum of litigation. There is loss of self-confidence. There have been studies done on this, the anesthesia attitudes to intraoperative death. The one in 2005 published in the European Journal of Anesthesiology. They found that 35% uh, of anesthesiologists interviewed declared that they felt a sense of personal responsibility for death. And when the consultants were uh, involved, almost 54% of the consultants uh, interviewed said that they felt they were responsible. Another article published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, where they found that uh, uh, almost 62% uh, of the people interviewed indicated that they were not able to uh, perform uh, elective cases uh, after facing perioperative death. When the impact of perioperative catastrophes on anesthesia was studied in the United States, published in 2012 in Anesthesia and Analgesia, they found that 75%, more than 75% of the individuals or respondents had feelings of anxiety, guilt, and kept on reliving the event. They had flashbacks of the event. And it took almost 35% of the individuals, almost a week to a month to have emotional recovery. And impact on uh, subsequent care, it took almost 25%, almost uh, a week to recover from the uh, trauma and to give subsequent care to subsequent patients. Now, this is an anesthesiologist element published in the Journal of Anesthesiology by R.C. Roy in 2011, where he mentions that it was not his fault. It was not the patient's fault. He should have been spared. And the tormenting fear that mine is the blame and the anesthesiologist takes it upon himself that it is his blame that the patient died. So in a sense, the anesthesiologist becomes the second victim of the catastrophe. 
and if vigilance is reduced as a consequence of depression or symptoms of acute stress disorder then the patient subsequently anesthetized by the affected anesthesiologist may become the third victims so the perioperative death the patient is the first victim the anesthesiologist will become the second victim and the future patients of the anesthesiologist if he doesn't recover properly becomes the third victims so you should have a proper support program the department should Uh, uh, give uh, proper support to the anesthesiologist relieve him from duty on that day focus on medical errors and adverse events provide psychological first aid have one on one and group support and this should be immediately available or shortly after the event this should be initiated and we should foster second victims coping strategies and personal resilience and reduce acute distress and facilitate access to continued care and when this program was implemented as shown in this publication in the journal of uh, american college of surgeons they found that 81% suggested that this program had a positive impact so you have an intraoperative death uh, you make sure that the uh, you break news properly have a debriefing and the anesthesiologist involved should be given adequate support now coming to certain medico legal aspects of uh, medical negligence if there is a death on operation table death within 24 hours post operatively or when there is an allegation of medical mismanagement as per the criminal procedure code section 39 it is our duty to inform the police and the relatives could uh, initiate criminal proceedings against you by going to the by filing a police complaint at the police station or they can initiate a private complaint to the judicial magistrate or the criminal courts now what are the stages of criminal procedure in india a uh, fir is filed for a cognizable offense and the procedure is set in motion a police investigation takes place where statements are recorded there are seizure of documents and arrest is based on the merits of the case so once the police report is filed there is a charge sheet is filed the court issues summons a trial is done and then judgment is given now it is very important for uh, us to know that for us to get implicated under ipc 304a uh, elements of negligence should be proved it should be proved that we owed a duty to the patient there was breach of duty an act must be done which has led to the damages for the patient so this has to be proven in a court of law but there are certain safeguards in the indian procedure code where they say that nothing is offence as per section 80 ipc if an accident occurs in doing a lawful act as per section 88 ipc nothing is an offense if acts are not intended to cause death done with consent in good faith for the patient's benefit and as per section 92 ipc nothing is an offense for acts done in good faith for the benefit of a person even without his consent the supreme court of india provides certain statutory safeguards in the form of judgments of Uh, in two landmark cases one is dr suresh gupta versus the national capital territory of delhi and 2004 and dr jacob matthew versus state of punjab in 2005 now these are two judgments which give status to safe got to the uh, medical professionals the first one is uh, dr suresh gupta versus the nct of delhi where here dr suresh gupta Uh, was a plastic surgeon and he and the anesthesiologist decided uh, that they do septoplasty for one of his patients and the intraoperative the patient died and the magisterial court uh, decided that the doctors are at fault and he the magisterial uh, judge the magistrate uh, suggested that the incision was put in the wrong area and the patient died because of aspiration of blood uh, and convicted the doctor the doctor appealed the high court uh, judges uh, said that uh, the magisterial uh, ju- sorry the magistrate was not medically qualified to say that the incision was put in the wrong place however they upheld the conviction saying that the post mortem shows blood in the upper uh, trachea and in the in the, uh, in the trachea and the uh, alveoli uh, <clears throat> Uh, the so uh, the doctor the, during the trial the anesthesiologist passed away and dr suresh gupta uh, 
appealed in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, uh, put up, set up an expert committee. The expert committee looked into it and they said that uh, during the procedure, there was an endotracheal, cuffed endotracheal tube, and it's very really unlikely that the blood in the trachea was because of aspiration and the patient could not have died of aspiration. And uh, since the postmortem was conducted three days after the death of the patient, uh, the blood could be because of the blood trickling down from the uh, nasal septum after the removal of the uh, endotracheal tube after the death of the patient. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, gave their judgment, they uh, acquitted the uh, Dr. Suresh Gupta and said that were a patient's death results merely from error of judgment or an accident, no criminal liability should be attached to it. Only a higher degree of morally blameworthy conduct and gross negligence would attract criminal liability. That was uh, Dr. Suresh Gupta versus NCT. And the other one is Dr. Jacob Matthew was a state of Punjab where uh, one of the patients who had, was admitted at CMZ Ludhiana uh, uh, died and uh, the relative said that it is because of the lack of oxygen cylinders and then he filed a case against the consultants, uh, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Matthews. The Supreme Court gave guidelines regarding prosecuting medical professionals as follows. They said that the investigating officer and the private complainant cannot always be supposed to have knowledge of medical science so as to determine whether the act of the accused medical professional amounts to rash or negligent act within the domain of criminal law under Section 304A of the IPC. The criminal process once initiated subjects the medical professional to serious embarrassment and sometimes harassment. He has to seek bail to escape arrest, which may or may not be granted to him. At the end, he may be exonerated by acquittal or discharge, but the loss which he has suffered to his reputation cannot be compensated by any standards. And they said that all we're doing is to emphasize the need for care and caution in the interest of society. For the service which the medical profession renders to human beings is probably the noblest of all. And hence, there is a need for protecting doctors from frivolous or unjust prosecution. So what did they say? They said seeking an expert opinion that a prima facie case exists is mandatory before issuing proceedings against involved doctors. This is a landmark judgment. So no FIR can be put in in cases of medical negligence without a preliminary inquiry by an expert board. In spite of all this, what can we do if an FIR is registered? First thing is don't panic. Involve the Indian Medical Association and the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. They are professional indemnity lawyers. Cooperate with the investigating team. Don't resist information. Give statement along with your legal team. Prepare a list of things that has been handed over and get them countersigned. And consider anticipatory bail. Now, what are the situations in which you can arrest a doctor? A doctor may not be arrested in a routine manner unless the arrest is necessary for furthering the investigation or for collecting the evidence or if the investigating officer is satisfied that the doctor may flee. Summarizing, perioperative deaths are a rare occurrence and physicians are known for neglecting their well-being to provide for their patients. And if you continue as if nothing happened, it may lead to significant harm not only to you but also can lead to provision of suboptimal care for your subsequent patients. So current data shows that anesthesiologists are likely to experience at least one perioperative death in their lifetime, and that at least 30% are profoundly affected by such an event, and that majority feel they require help from others after the event. Many feel they should stop work for that day. So the department should find provision for that, and the earlier in the training that this occurs, the more stressful it is to the anesthesiologist. Additionally, anesthesia training does not traditionally address patient death and how to communicate with families and other related parties after an adverse event. So this may increase the risk for stress-related hazards in the aftermath of a perioperative death. So national guidelines should be formulated by ISA or IMA 
where instruction for anesthesiologists at all levels of training in coping with the aftermath of poor outcomes, suggestions for creation of departmental infrastructure to provide customized support for affected individuals, including time out of the OR as needed, an agenda for furthering research, particularly into the effects of the perioperative catastrophe on subsequent professional functioning of the OR team, and an agenda for incorporating skills related to handling the aftermath of perioperative catastrophes into anesthesia training programs. These are the four areas which, on which national guidelines have to be formulated. So I would like to conclude by saying that arrivals are not desirable, of course, but everyone understands that they are unavoidable. They are a part of medical practice. Errors are inherent in football as they are in medicine, business, science, law, love, and life. In the final analysis, the test of a nation's character and of an individual's integrity does not depend on being error-free. It depends on what we do after making the error, how we can cope with that error. Thank you all for that wonderful uh, Thank you all for the patient listening. And it was uh, very nice to be part of uh, the ISA Bellary academic activity. Thank you.